on World News Tonight. Decisive moments. Control of Congress hangs in the balance with vote counts coming down to the wire. Tense talks. The US and Russia put aside their polarity in favour of covert discussions on the war in Ukraine. Paying the price. The COP27 summit highlights financial benchmarks to be conquered in fighting climate change. And twinkling skies. Silent lights up under thousands of lanterns littering the night sky. This is Other Than Arna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Americans cast the final ballots in closely fought elections that will determine whether Democrats lose control of Congress and with it the ability to push forward on President Joe Biden's agenda in the next two years. To give us a clear image of the situation and the election, we have other than a world special correspondent, Dinette Vijaywadhan, reporting from Massachusetts in the United States. Dinette. The final polls of the midterm elections are out and can help give us an answer to the question on everyone's mind. Who will come out on top, the Democrats or the Republicans? Indications are that the Republican Party is on the verge of taking back control of the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in four years. The upper chamber of Congress, the Senate, remains too close to call. There are more paths to a Republican victory in the Senate than for Democrats, who have held the barest of majorities there for the past two years. Understanding how it could unfold in both chambers is just a question of maths. In the House, Republicans need to flip only five seats out of the 435 in the chamber to have a majority. The 100-seat Senate is somewhat simpler to understand. Only 35 seats are up for election this year, and there are only a handful of closely contested races. A net change of one seat towards the Republicans will swing the chamber to them. Given that Democrats are trying to protect more seats than Republicans, there are simply more ways for Democrats to lose the Senate than to win it. That gives the Republicans the upper hand, albeit by the narrowest of margins. It appears likely that Republicans will control at least one chamber of Congress once the dust settles on these midterm elections. After two years of unified Democratic control in Washington, the power dynamic in the nation's capital is poised to shift. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Dinat Vijaywardhan, reporting from Massachusetts in the United States. Now, as results from the 2022 midterm elections come flowing in, it's not the result that most Republicans expected. What most Republicans expected as a red wave in the U.S. Senate boiled down to a neck-to-neck -neck fight between the GOP and the Democratic Party. The results for the U.S. House of Representatives, however, is another story, with Republicans leading the polls from the first result to be released. This, too, was not the landslide victory that most Republicans, both candidates and voters, expected. The battle for control of Congress is coming down to a dwindling number of key races, with Democrats dashing Republicans' hopes for a red wave and both parties hanging on to hopes of winning narrow majorities. Republicans began the night with a rout in Florida where Governor Ron DeSantis won heavily Hispanic, historically Democratic regions on his way to a blowout victory that could serve as a launch pad for a 2024 presidential run. But in the hours that have followed, Democrats have fought back. In Pennsylvania, Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman defeated Republican Mehmet Oz for the seat of retiring Republican Senator Pat Toomey. Three Democratic-controlled House races in Virginia were widely viewed as an early warning signal for the night's results. Democrats held seats in two Virginia districts Biden won in 2020. Democratic Jennifer Wexton won her re-election bid in Virginia's 10th district. In an even more competitive race, Representative Abigail Spanberger also won re-election in Virginia's 7th district. But Democrats lost in southeastern Virginia, with the Republican state Senator Jen Kiggins defeated Democratic Representative Elaine Luria. Governor Ron DeSantis led a dominant Republican ticket in Florida, delivering historic margins in Democratic territory in his victory over Democratic Representative. Charlie Crist on a night that provides him a powerful argument if he seeks the GOP's 2024 presidential nomination. The easy wins by DeSantis, who led by nearly 20 percentage points with 92% of the estimated vote counted, and Senator Marco Rubio, who was 17 points up, were enough to cast doubt on Florida's status as a national bellwether. In Michigan, Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who stalked her re-election campaign on her successful efforts to block the reinforcement of the state's 1931 law banning abortion, in almost all instances defeated Republican challenger Tudor Dixon, who had waged a campaign focused on cultural battles. Michigan voters also approved a Whitmer-backed amendment to the state's constitution that will scrap the 1931 law and guarantee abortion rights. Voters in California and Vermont also greenly constitutional amendments enshrining abortion rights.
Meanwhile, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has held undisclosed talks with top Russian officials in hopes of reducing the risk of war in Ukraine spilling over or escalating into a nuclear conflict. The newspaper cited U.S. and allied officials as saying that Sullivan, President Joe Biden's top aide on national security, held confidential conversations in recent months with Kremlin aide Yuri Ushakov that were not disclosed publicly. Despite openly clashing over Ukraine, the White House and the Kremlin are keeping communication channels open. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan confirmed Monday he had been in contact with top aides to Vladimir Putin for several months. The private talks largely focused on limiting escalation of the war in Ukraine and preventing the use of nuclear weapons. We in the Biden administration have had the opportunity to engage at senior levels with the Russians to communicate, uh, to reduce risk, to convey the consequences of the potential use of nuclear weapons. Vladimir Putin has repeatedly hinted he could resort to nuclear force if things didn't go his way in Ukraine, drawing international condemnation and a fierce rebuke by U.S. officials. It remains unclear whether the Russian president has been directly involved in recent talks with Washington, with the Kremlin having so far refused to confirm the information without denying it outright. We have nothing to say about this publication. Anglo-Saxon newspapers publish a lot of falsehoods. During the Cold War, the White House and the Kremlin maintained a direct communications channel known as the Hotline to help reduce the possibility of nuclear war. Now, Kherson is bracing for what could be one of the war's most important battles. Russia ordered civilians out of the area, expecting a Ukrainian assault to recapture the city amid continuous battles and shelling in other parts of the country. Ukrainian military officials are urging citizens to evacuate to safer spaces. The east of Ukraine is seeing intense combat. The Donetsk region remains the epicenter of the greatest madness of the occupiers. Hundreds die daily. The ground before the Ukrainian positions is littered with bodies of the occupiers. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says more than 50 settlements, including Zaporizhia and the Kyrgyzstan region, were hit by missiles, airplanes and multiple launch rocket systems. Meanwhile, in recent days, Russia has ordered civilians out of the southern city of Kyrgyzstan in anticipation of a Ukrainian assault to recapture the city. Following this, Ukraine accused Russia of looting empty homes in Kyrgyzstan and occupying them with troops in civilian clothes to prepare for street fighting in what both sides predict will be one of the war's most important battles. The conflict also seems to be intensifying in northern Ukraine. Ukrainian military officials from the northern region of Chernihiv are urging citizens to evacuate from border areas amid a spike in attacks by Russian forces. Although Chernihiv is a long way from the fierce combat in Donbas and Kyrgyzstan, it has reportedly endured 234 hits in the past week alone compared to 87 hits the week before. And in the Donetsk region, the local police on Monday also released a video of police officers evacuating residents in eastern Ukraine's Bakhmut city. An evacuation was carried out once again. People were taken out of the most dangerous area of Bakhmut. A woman and her husband, who can't walk, he was being carried by hand from the building. Meanwhile, President Zelensky on Monday said Russia must be forced into genuine peace negotiations. Speaking about the opening of COP27, the Ukrainian leader said that anyone who seriously considers the climate agenda must also seriously consider the need to immediately stop Russian aggression. He added that Moscow has repeatedly shown it is unwilling to engage in such negotiations. British Minister Gavin Williamson resigned from the government over claims that he bullied colleagues, raising questions about Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's judgment just weeks into the job. Britain's new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is taking another hit, with Minister Gavin Williamson resigning from his government on Tuesday over claims of bullying. The junior cabinet office minister said he made the move to comply fully with an investigation into whether he had bullied colleagues while in previous roles. Sunak has come under pressure for some of his ministerial choices after he was elected as Britain's third prime minister in the span of two months under the promise of restoring integrity to the heart of government. Williamson was one of them. He had previously been sacked from roles as Minister of Defence and of Education by Sunak's predecessors Theresa May and Boris Johnson. 
Since his fresh appointment two weeks ago, British media have reported accusations by colleagues that Williamson had treated government officials aggressively and sent expletive-laden messages to colleagues, including one message that told an official to slit your throat. In a letter to Sunak on Tuesday, Williamson said he refuted the characterization of the messages, but that he recognized that they were becoming a distraction for the government. He said in the letter, which he published on Twitter, quote, I have therefore decided to step back from government so that I can comply fully with the complaints process that is underway and clear my name of any wrongdoing. Adding that, it is with real sadness that I tender my resignation. Sunak on Tuesday evening said he accepts the resignation with great sadness and supports Williamson's decision to step back. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Twelve days on from the horrific scenes in Itaewon, a briefing was held to discuss measures to try and prevent future incidents of that kind occurring again. A task force solely focused on disaster prevention and management is being set up to deal with a range of response and management plans. By the end of the year, South Korea will come up with a comprehensive plan of action to prevent tragedies like that which occurred in Itaewon from ever happening again. That's according to the nation's interior minister, Lee Sang-min, speaking at a Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters meeting on Wednesday. As part of the plan, a task force will be formed to, quote, shift the paradigm of national disaster prevention and safety measures. The government will work to improve emergency first response, focus on the prevention of disasters and take a scientific approach to disaster management. Meanwhile, as of Wednesday morning, 18 of those injured during the Halloween weekend tragedy are still being treated in hospitals. As for the 26 foreign nationals who died, the remains of 20 have been repatriated to their home countries, while two have been laid to rest in South Korea. The other four will be repatriated to their home countries beginning this week. Minister E said that with regard to the families of the remaining four foreign national victims, South Korea will continue to provide assistance upon their arrival to Korea. As global delegates continue with climate talks at COP27, a report says that some two trillion US dollars per year will be needed by the end of the decade to help developing countries cut carbon emissions and deal with the effects of climate hazards. As the world continues to witness climate hazards, experts estimate that around two trillion U.S. dollars will be needed annually by 2030 to help developing countries cope with the effects of climate change. Setting a report jointly commissioned by the governments of Britain and Egypt, the Guardian reported Tuesday that would be the cost of helping poor nations switch away from fossil fuels and invest in renewable energy as well as other low-carbon technology. The report, which was presented at the U.S. COP27 Climate Summit, also explains that the costs needed to cover the needs stemming from all of the world's developing countries exceed any past climate financial aid designed to help poor countries. The report also elaborated that around half of the required financing can come from local sources, including bolstering domestic public finance and capital markets. However, it emphasized that external finance coming from the World Bank as well as other global institutions must also play a key role. It added that current investment stands at only around $500 million. As part of the external financing, the report called for developing countries to work closely with investors, development banks and rich countries to secure $1 trillion a year by the end of the decade. The issue is likely to be on the agenda as talks continue in Egypt on Wednesday. A German humanitarian group said its ship docked in southern Italy early Tuesday and disembarked 89 people rescued at sea, ending one migrant rescue saga as others continue under Italy's new hard-right government. Anger and despair aboard a migrant rescue ship docked at Catania in Sicily. The protest erupted over the Italian government's refusal to let those remaining on board disembark. The Geo Barons, carrying 572 migrants, arrived at the port on Sunday. Only families and those with medical problems were allowed to leave. It and another NGO vessel, the Humanity, have been ordered to leave Catania. 
Both are refusing to set sail amid a deepening standoff. Elsewhere, relief for migrants on a third ship, the Rise Above. After days of waiting off the Italian coast, all passengers were taken off. This is chicken pox. We can't bathe her. It's been 10 days since we last bathed her. She can't eat. She only cries. Have mercy for this baby. The newly installed government of Georgia Maloney was elected on a promise of taking a hard line with migrant ships. They insist the countries whose flag the boats fly should take the passengers in, potentially putting them on a collision course with other European governments. As conditions deteriorate on ships waiting at sea, those on board can only wait and hope for a resolution. The Department of Science and Innovation and NASA signed a letter of intent to formalize a space exploration partnership. Ground was broken at the future site of a station in South Africa's semi-desert Karoo region, part of a global network that will soon help NASA track history-making missions to the moon and beyond. This site in South Africa will soon be a key part of NASA's history-making return to the moon and beyond. Located about 130 miles from Cape Town, Mikey's Fontaine will be home to a deep space ground station. The site will help track NASA's Artemis program, which aims to land the first woman and person of color on the moon by 2025. It will include a three-story tall dish, and as part of a network of other ground stations in the US and Australia, it will help improve coverage and redundancy for critical mission support. Phil Majwara is the head of South Africa's Department of Science and Innovation. NASA would not come to South Africa uh, if they didn't feel that we have capacities to do the work that they want us to do in partnership with them. NASA official Badger Yunus was on hand to break ground at the site. We are looking forward to it. This is going to be one of three stations supporting the communication with all of our astronauts in and around the moon and providing viable services to our entire moon to Mars uh, program. The South African Space Agency will establish, operate and maintain the station. The site was chosen because of its proximity to key infrastructure, geographic location and low radio interference. South Africa has made an initial investment of nearly $4 million and the site is set to come online in 2025, the same year NASA is planning to return astronauts to the moon. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Walt Disney said its marquee streaming service Disney Plus gained more subscribers than Wall Street had expected, but investment costs dragged quarterly earnings below analyst targets. Binance, the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, has signed a non-binding agreement to buy its major rival FTX.com, a non-US unit of FTX, to help cover a liquidity crunch. For years, Japanese shoppers eagerly shelled out for the latest gadgets, but now a tumbling yen has put new iPhones out of reach for some and sparked a growing second-hand trade in a major market for Apple. Chevron said fire crews were responding to an isolated fire inside its 269,000 barrel per day El Segundo refinery in California with no injuries due to the incident. Supporters of former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan blocked roads near the capital disrupting traffic and forcing schools to close days after an assassination attempt targeted their leader at a recent anti-government rally. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any news stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash otherthanenglish. We leave you tonight with visuals of thousands of people flocking to Thailand's northern Chiang Mai province to release thousands of lanterns into the sky to celebrate the annual Yi Peng Festival, also known as the Thai Festival of Lights. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.